Assalamu alaikum and good morning to all of you in joining today. Uh, my name is Dr. Aish Labedli and I serve as the Capacity Building Director at Qatar National Research Fund. As the chair of the judging panel, I would like to welcome you all on behalf of QNRF and Shell Qatar to the online edition of the 12th Annual Undergraduate Research Program Competition, where we <clears throat> showcase the research work of students and faculty members and honor the outstanding Europe projects completed in 2019. Uh, con considering the situation and the spread of COVID-19 decided to host this competition virtually rather than postponing it. So with the spread of the pandemic, the whole world is realizing the important role of played by this and researchers as we all desperately wait for a vaccine or a cure to be developed to abate this virus. Therefore, we believe that this, it is important to recognize our local student researchers and encourage them uh, to pursue research which has a global impact. This year, we shortlisted 14 projects from a pool of 46 projects to compete for the Europe Awards. These teams will have the opportunity to present their projects to both the public and our expert panel of judges today and tomorrow. I'm glad to introduce our senior panel of judges for this competition. Dr. Hisham Saber, Director of Technical Team at the QNRF. Dr. Drov Arora, Research and Development and Technology Manager at Shell Qatar Research and Technology Center. Uh, Dr. Amar Bukhre, Senior Manager, Energy and Environment. Dr. Mohamed Jarrar, Senior Manager, Health and Biomedical Sciences. Dr. Munir Tag, Senior Manager, ICT. And Dr. Hatim Hini, Senior Manager, Social Science, Arts and Humanities. This event will run. <coughs> Over two days, today we'll have presentations related to energy and environment as well as ICT. And inshallah tomorrow, uh, we will continue with biomedical and health as well as social sciences, arts and humanities presentations. Uh, for the students, all presentations will be evaluated and judged based on the scientific contents and merits of the project, research outcome and impact, benefits and experience gained by the students, the quality, and organization of the presentation, and lastly, presentation delivery and skills. Before starting with our first presentation, I would like to thank Shell Qatar to working with us to create a horizon to develop undergraduate research in Qatar through a long-standing partnership that continues to bring us closer to achieve the vision of our country's research and development sector. So I'll start now with our first presenter is Abdullah Shaat from Texas A&M University at Qatar, and his presentation is entitled Investigation, the, Vis the Viability of Nanoparticles in Drilling Fluids as Additives to for Fluid Loss and Will Bore Stability. Welcome, Abdel. Thank you, Dr. Aisha. I'll just uh, share my screen now. You have, uh, Abdullah, you have only 10 minutes for your presentation. Should I start? Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Abdullah Shahat, and today I'm presenting the project about the investigation of the viability of nanoparticles yes, and drilling fluids as additives for fluid loss prevention and well worth stability. I am uh, representing my teammates, uh, Leita Bogosh, Maha Salaiti, and Najla Badar. We worked on this project last year under the super supervision and mentorship of Dr. Alberto Sitnanto and Mr. Uh, Ramel Iraq. I just want to highlight before we start that this is a novel idea that was never done before. And if we prove such statement, it will uh, revolutionize the drilling industry and the petroleum engineering uh, industry. Uh, in the beginning, this uh, research targets uh, short-term uh, improvements and uh, uh, meets long-term needs. The world energy demand is uh, increasing by the day where oil and gas are the top two energy resources. This is expected to stay uh, the same until 2040, which is according to a study by CAPP, uh, with an uh, energy demands uh, increase of at least uh, 30%. And to meet those demands, uh, the process uh, uh, or uh, petroleum engineering processes need to improve uh, in, in terms of efficiency, economics, and being more environmentally friendly. Uh, this research focuses on the drilling fluids, which are fluids that 
that are pumped into the well bore during the uh, drilling processes to lubricate and cool the drilling bit and uh, take uh, small uh, uh, cuttings back to the surface, balance the well bore pressure and prevent fluid loss from uh, well bore to the reservoir, which we will be targeting in this research. As mentioned earlier, the energy demand is increasing and the conventional reservoirs are almost depleted. And therefore we need uh, more unconventional uh, reservoirs uh, to be produced from. And uh, this requires modifications to the drilling fluids, for example. The addition of uh, nanoparticles in the drilling fluids uh, would, in theory, uh, block the uh, block the pores in the well bore, as you can see in the figure, and prevent the fluid loss from the well bore to to the reservoir. This, in return, uh, reduces the damage zone in the well bore and helps uh, increasing the production and saving the cost of uh, lost uh, uh, drilling mud. So um, uh, there were several uh, nanoparticles available in the market. Uh, we chose uh, copper oxide because it withstands high temperature and high pressure. Magnesium oxide was chosen because, it, uh, uh, because of its uh, low toxicity value. And uh, aluminum oxide was chosen because of its weight and electrical properties. With that said, we can uh, better understand the project objectives now. Uh, which are as follows. We wanted to test the use of nanoparticles in drilling fluids to protect the environment, reduce fluid loss, uh, and improve the well integrity, ensure well stability, and uh, account for unconventional reservoirs at high temperature and high pressure. Uh, another long-term objective is to use the nanoparticles and other common problems or practices in, in Qatar. This was done by uh, using uh, uh, t t three testing equipment, which uh, mimic the well bore conditions to simulate the fluid loss. Each uh, of these equipment have uh, their own uh, uh, has its own uh, conditions uh, in, in terms of temperature and pressure and testing. So, for example, API and the HTHP or high temperature high pressure are both static, and the permeable plugging test or PPT is the dynamic one that requires the depth sizes. For this uh, equipment, we varied the uh, nanoparticle uh, concentrations uh, from 3%, 5%, and 10%. And we tested uh, the samples with and without nanoparticles and for each uh, concentration. Uh, for the PPT test, we also varied the desk sizes, uh, 10 micron, uh, 5 micron, 10 micron, and 15 micron. Uh, to see the, the uh, correlation between the uh, nanoparticles and uh, the concentration and the uh, uh, desk size. Now, ideally, uh, uh, performing these uh, experiments would take a total time of 50 hours in the lab. However, that's ideal. In real life, it took us over one month to just uh, simulate the first case, which is uh, the base case with no nanoparticles. Uh, this is just to give you an indication of how long it took us to perform and collect all these data that you can see uh, here. Uh, after applying the test and uh, 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 with and without nanoparticles, the results are obtained. And uh, we can see them here in these two tables. And we will be focusing on the total fluid loss of each uh, experiment. This table shows an example of uh, uh, copper oxide at each concentration and mesh size. You can see that uh, these are the concentrations. And here, at each concentration, we are varying also the mesh size. And we will also have the total uh, fluid loss. To better view the results, let's look at the bar chart here. We can see that the in the API, or the low temperature, low pressure test, all nanoparticles contributed to, the, uh, to reducing uh, fluid loss when compared to the uh, case with no nanoparticles. Uh, we also can verify that uh, with in increasing the uh, concentration, we also uh, reduce the fluid loss further, which proves our statement that we were investigating in this uh, uh, project. Looking at the high temperature, high pressure plot, we also see uh, the same trends uh, with na where nanoparticles uh, contributed to fluid loss uh, prevention. Uh, we noticed that aluminum oxide did not do uh, well uh, at low concentrations. However, it was still better than the case uh, with no nanoparticles. In the PPT test uh, for size 10 uh, micron desk, uh, uh, the same was observed for copper oxide and uh, magnesium oxide. Uh, however, uh, aluminum oxide did not uh, 
uh, contribute to fluid loss at uh, low concentrations, as you can see that it is almost the same with no nanoparticles. For size 15 micron, uh, the uh, PPT test uh, gave closer results between magnesium oxide and aluminum oxide, uh, where copper oxide continued to uh, follow the same trends as uh, previous tests. The significance of these results is that we can uh, decrease the fluid loss and uh, we prove the statement uh, at uh, an average of 58% for copper oxide, 50% uh, uh, for magnesium oxide and 41% for aluminum oxide at low temperature and low pressure. At high temperature and high pressure, uh, we also have an average of 58% for copper oxide, 49% reduction for magnesium oxide and 30% reduction for uh, aluminum oxide. oxide. The same uh, was proven in the PPT test uh, at uh, a lower scale. In general, reducing the fluid loss would lead to a huge economical uh, and environmental uh, benefits. Uh, looking at an example, uh, at a local example from the Qatar Petroleum website, there are 600 wells in Dukhan. If we double that to account for the North Field, which has a lot more, so we'll only consider 1,200 wells at a cost of average of 200,000 of uh, drilling mud that is uh, based on research, uh, we will see that the, the cost of uh, pumping the mud is uh, 880 uh, million Qatar riyals. And uh, we saw that uh, copper oxide has a range of uh, reduction from 36% to uh, 58%. Uh, and therefore, we can save uh, from 314 uh, million. Excuse to me, Abdullah, you have riyals. only, excuse me, Abdullah, you have left. Thanks. Okay. Go ahead. To 510 million Qatar riyals. Uh, this just to give you a scale of how important this uh, technology would be if we use it. Uh, th these are the microns that we used, and you can see on the top uh, that there's uh, the mud cake that is accumulated. Uh, in conclusion, the use of nanoparticles had a great impact uh, on fluid loss prevention. Uh, copper oxide was the most effective uh, nanoparticle. Uh, aluminum oxide had a great relative reduction in fluid loss. And uh, an example of uh, using copper oxide would save uh, from 314 to 510 million riyals. Uh, aluminum oxide we, we performed weekly in uh, high temperature uh, and uh, low temperature. Uh, copper oxide provides a, a great economic solution when compared to magnesium oxide and aluminum oxide. Uh, after this project, we want to further evaluate the effect of nanoparticles using different mixtures based on properties that we obtained from this research. Uh, also, we want to conduct a complete study, uh, not only in drilling, but also completed with the completions uh, processes. Uh, we also want to see if there is a possibility of collaboration with the industry and publishing uh, our paper in international conferences. In the end, I would like to thank the Qatar National Research Fund for funding this project, the Undergraduate Research Experience Project organizers for uh, allowing uh, such uh, students to experience such uh, projects that are life-changing, the Texas A&M University at Qatar and Petroleum Engineering Departments for providing the lab and equipment that uh, we needed uh, to perform these experiments. Uh, and uh, thank you, listeners and judge, uh, judge, judges. Uh, uh, if you have any questions, please let me know. I'll be I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you, um, dear panelists. Uh, we are ready to receive your questions right now. I think we will start. Uh, uh, what the um, screen of the uh, panelists who raised their hands? I have four participants. Please, can you go? So. Dr. Hisham? Dr. Hisham yes, is the first, but I, I have just, yeah. Dr. Hisham, please go ahead. Oh, yes. Uh, <clears throat> hi, Abdullah. Many thanks for a very interesting uh, presentation. I have a couple of questions that perhaps reflect my interest in the subject rather than my knowledge of it. Uh, the first one is um, uh, you, you concluded that the copper oxide outperformed the others, but you didn't tell us why do you think that was. Um, uh, also, in terms of, of, of cost, uh, would, would that be the first choice in terms of, of the, the uh, economic feasibility of it, uh, as opposed to just technical? Uh, my other question is, um, you, you prevent the loss of, of, of the drilling mud by actually blocking the pores with, with the micro 
uh, with the nanoparticles, but that represents a loss of nanoparticles. Now, wouldn't, wouldn't that represent also a loss that might contribute to the, uh, have you actually weighed the, the, the loss of the, of the uh, nanoparticles uh, as opposed to the loss of, of the uh, drilling mud in terms of cost? Thank you. Yes, uh, uh, first, uh, first question about the uh, economic part. Uh, yes, copper oxide was uh, also cheaper than uh, both aluminum and magnesium oxide. Uh, also, uh, we tested the, uh, based on average uh, cost of drilling mud, that the loss of uh, nanoparticles in the well bore would still be uh, economically feasible and uh, would still save us money when regards to losing uh, mud because it's not only about losing the mud, it's also about the damage zone uh, around the well bore. So when, when you uh, uh, drill and pump the, uh, the drilling fluid, some of the fluid goes inside, therefore pushing the oil and pushing the uh, hydrocarbons uh, uh, away from the well bore. And that uh, creates what's called uh, as a damage uh, region. And uh, to overcome this, we need to uh, do even more processes such as uh, acidizing or uh, or fracking or uh, uh, some advanced uh, pr production processes to even overcome the uh, damaged uh, zone. But why, why do you think the copper oxide outperformed the others? Because of its uh, properties. So copper oxide can withstand high temperature and high pressure. Uh, for example, uh, aluminum oxide uh, can't at let's say high temperature and high pressure uh, for uh, in reservoir conditions. This, uh, this nanoparticle, uh, uh, let's say, uh, melts uh, or uh, uh, is vanished because of pressure. But uh, copper oxide can withstand that reservoir pressure. Thank you. Thank you. The next, well, who's next? Wael. Yes, Dr. Hadim. Dr. Hadim. Uh, Dr. Hadim, please uh, unmute yourself. We cannot hear you. <coughs> uh, congratulations, Abdullah, for this uh, interesting presentation. Thank you. Uh, I, I noted in the uh, poster and also in your uh, conclusion uh, that uh, a complete study of nanoparticles and drilling and uh, completion will be conducted in the future to solve several petroleum engineering problems in Qatar. Uh, as much as you know, uh, are there some research actually implemented uh, in this field, in this, uh, uh, around this uh, idea. And uh, some of uh, the member of uh, students' teams, uh, are they involved in this uh, researches now? Uh, and you, uh, personally, are you willing to do, uh, to do it, that is participate to these researches, uh, if you are asked it and uh, why? Thank you. Okay. Um, for example, uh, I, I just, because uh, you asked uh, multiple questions, I... Just, uh, do you the have first one about uh, the, the implementation of uh, these research, uh, uh, what you called uh, a complete study of nanoparticles in drilling? Yes. So, uh, uh, as far as I know, as, and as far as we research in the literature, there are uh, uh, only a few that are uh, studying the nanoparticles, and so beca because this is what uh, petroleum engineers call the future of petroleum engineering, uh, where we use nanoparticles to uh, recover more and more oil, but uh, not at this scale, and not uh, the, the same way we did it, and not the same uh, experiment and equipment that we had. Uh, we were also uh, able to build a relationship between concentration and uh, uh, the fluid loss prevention, uh, quantify it. It was not, not just a research, uh, a theory-based uh, research. 
furthermore, I know like there are some other projects that deal with nanoparticles within our campus. Uh, and uh, regarding a complete study, uh, by that I meant uh, not only drilling, but also the completion. Because uh, as I said, uh, nanoparticles uh, would be used in the future, for example, to be pumped and uh, change the wettability phase, for example, or uh, push more oil or uh, replace the uh, residual oil saturation in the reservoir. Uh, as, as regards to the, uh, my teammates who are involved, uh, we, we did uh, several meetings uh, because we all uh, graduated. Uh, I now am con continuing uh, my master's in chemical engineering. But we still had uh, several meetings in preparation uh, to this, uh, for this presentation. Uh, but uh, they were involved in the, from the first day until the, the last day they graduated in terms of uh, experiment and uh, research writing, uh, as well as uh, I was. Uh, we took turns. We basically had almost the same classes and same timings. So we took turns uh, together in the lab uh, with uh, the mentor. And uh, that was uh, th th that was enjoyable. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Munir. Please. Yeah, thank you very much for the presentation. I have uh, a few questions. So I think when you started your project, you did some literature analysis. I mean, a study, and uh, you, you claim that it is innovative. But uh, the idea actually is not new because there, there are publications uh, from 2012. Uh, uh, there is a paper on investigation on the viability of nanoparticles in drilling fluids as additive for fluid loss, uh, loss and well bore stability, 2012. There is a, another publication, 2017, nanoparticle based drilling fluid with improved characteristics, uh, 2016, and nanoparticle, uh, nano based drilling fluids uh, review, 2017. So, I mean, the idea exists already. Maybe uh, the nanoparticles used in the past are different from yours. They use the iron oxide and zinc oxide. You're using copper, magnesium, and aluminum oxide. Uh, so, uh, uh, from your perspective, uh, well, I mean, uh, from uh, I mean, uh, what would be the benefit of your approach com uh, compared to the other approaches that were done in the past? Uh, uh, you know, in uh, 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 by other uh, by other uh, researchers and by, by other uh, uh, scientists. Okay, uh, first of all, uh, as you said, uh, the difference in uh, nanoparticles, uh, that adds to the knowledge of the industry, not only to our knowledge, but uh, to everyone's knowledge. And if we publish the paper, then everyone will be able to access that uh, knowledge. And we will be able to have uh, not only uh, 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 nanoparticle uh, X, Y, and Z, but also A, B, and C. And uh, we can compare them, we can compare the results, and uh, with that, understand the properties that we need. For example, what is the mix that, uh, that we need exactly to uh, get the best uh, efficiency out of nan nanoparticles? Is it a mix between copper oxide and uh, magnesium oxide or is it uh, some other nanoparticle? So uh, the research is always adding to the knowledge of the public. Uh, and uh, this is uh, by itself the addition uh, to, to uh, the industry. But other than that, also, we were able to quantify it. Uh, we found many papers, uh, as you said, uh, but uh, me, like uh, uh, um, a great percentage of them had uh, uh, theory-based uh, projects uh, that, are, that uh, nanoparticles should do or could do, but uh, only a few of them quantified that, uh, that knowledge. Um, I just, uh, okay, thank you. A, a quick question. Uh, you mentioned about the savings. Okay, but what would be the cost of your approach? I mean, uh, in terms of copper oxide or uh, or aluminum oxide or magnesium oxide, what would be the cost? The cost, ben I did, you do it. I did the cost benefit analysis. Uh, we did the cost benefit analysis. Uh, I, I don't have the numbers uh, right now, but uh, in the beginning of the project, in the, in the uh, very early stages, we did the cost benefit analysis based on the average uh, mud cost, uh, uh, drilling mud cost. And uh, we were uh, like, before starting the project and even writing the abstract, we asked ourselves, uh, is this feasible or is this uh, gonna cost us more than, uh, than normal procedures to, to, uh, save, uh, to save money or not? Uh, and uh, our answer was yes. Uh, we proved that uh, it was, uh, uh, feasible, and that's why we moved forward with the project. 
You don't have specific figures? Uh, thank you. Currently, Excuse me, no. Dr. Munir. Excuse me, uh, the time is done. We are, we have to stop now. And I believe um, if we can, uh, thank you. Thank you, Abdullah, for your presentation. Mm -hmm. uh, if you allow me, uh, panelists, please just one question for each of you, because still I do have two of the judges hasn't uh, or haven't um, asked questions. So please just be, um, just to raise just one question. Thank you to all of you. Um, our second next presentation would uh, Arima Dosari from Texas a &M University, and to present the um, her presentation is about F effect of nanoparticles on alternative fuel sprays at high pressure conditions. Welcome, Arim. Thank you, Dictora. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, just let me al allow me to open my presentation. Okay. So good morning. My name is Zarima Dosari. I'm from Texas A&M University, and I'm here today to present our project that studies the effect of nanoparticles on jet fuel spray performance. So nowadays, with the rapid increase of aviation transportation jobs and their resultant emissions, it was found that the aviation sector contributes about 3% to the global CO2 emissions at 2018. However, if we extrapolate the ongoing business, this contribution might increase up to 20% by mid-century. Therefore, we need to address the impact of this sector and come up with better engines or fuel to mitigate the resultant emissions. But before we come up with potential solutions, first we need to understand what is happening in here. So basically, the combustor of the aircraft is using the drop in fuel to generate energy, and at the same time, it generates some undesired byproducts. Those pollutants are being derived from the used fuel, such as Jet A1. So we might ask how we can uh, reduce the aircraft emissions. We can do that by using cleaner fuels, such as gas to liquid, or use some kind of fuel additives that will enhance the combustion process and therefore mitigate the resultant emissions. So in this work, we were interested in using the nanotechnology, which is basically converting microscale micro particles into nanoscale particles. And we want to test the, uh, mix those particles with jet fuels and see how those particles will affect the fuel physical properties and eventually influence the spray performance. So our bottom, uh, bottom line or the basic idea is if we have better spray, we're gonna have a better combustion process and therefore less emissions. Also another motivation of ours is that there were no such studies reported uh, in the literature regarding GTL fuel with nanoparticles at elevated conditions. So we want to address that knowledge gap here. Now, in terms of the scope of this research, we want to understand what is happening inside the jet engine combustor. You can look at this figure. Basically, the jet fuel will be sprayed from a swirling nozzle and then breaks up at two stages and evaporate at the third till it meets, it meets the ignition source and then deflagrate. But our interest here is only the first two stages and we plan to study that. So basically our plan is to, to use two different types of fuel. One is a conventional and the other is alternative. And we want to study those fuels with different nanoparticles concentration and to see how those particles will alter the fuel physical properties and how it will perform at amb high ambient conditions. And most importantly, we want to study the non-reactive spray performance. Now for the fuel preparation part, basically we took ba the base fuel, which is either type of the fuels that I mentioned, and we won't mix them with nanoparticles. And to ensure that the particles won't agglomerate or settle at the bottom, we added a surfactant. Also, we want to ensure that we have high levels of stability. We ultrasonicated all the samples in the study. Now for the spray facility, I just want to highlight that this, uh, the whole facility was developed as a part of a previous NPRE project. Now, if you look here, we have the spray vessel that is surrounded by a ballistic grade walls from all four sides to ensure high levels of safety. And we have the fuel supply system, fuel temperature control and data acquisition set up all outside. Now, if you look closely inside the, uh, at the spray vessel, you can see that we have a high speed camera attached and the spray vessel itself has four optical windows. 
Now this is for the schematics. Basically, this is how it will work. Uh, the nitrogen gas and the fuel will all be supplied to the spray chamber and all the valves surrounding it with the high speed camera will be controlled by the computer. Now for the imaging technique, this is a close up to the spray uh, chamber. You can see that we have two encountering optical windows. One has a light source and the other one has the light uh, speed camera. The fuel will be sprayed from the middle here by a swirling nozzle and we'll get something like that. So the acquisition rate is 32,000 frames per second and all the captured images were used in the spray performance analysis. Now for the result, the result for the fuel properties, you can see that we have the properties here and we have the nanofuel concentration and nanoparticles concentration in here. And we have for each concentration, we have the two mentioned types of fuel. And what we notice is as we increase the nanoparticles concentration, we tend to have a thicker liquid, but it's less adhesive. Now for the spray performance, we, we evaluated three important parameters. The first one is the cone angle near the nozzle. The second one is a liquid sheet breakup distance, and the third is the spray velocity. And all experiments were performed at inert conditions. Now here, I just want to highlight that AGP stands for ambient gas pressure. And here you can see that we have the spray image, but it was average, like thousands of uh, images were average to calculate the cone angle. And what we notice is as we go down, increasing the ambient gas pressure, the cone angle is being uh, converted in, uh, inwardly. Now there is a, so we noticed that there is an inversely proportional relationship between cone angle and AGP. And the results were ranging between 36 degrees and uh, 24 degrees. However, those results were in the range of uncertainty and that was due to our source of limitation. It was because the, um, the cone angle is a function of the nozzle geometry which is which in our case, it was only one nozzle. So that was a source of limitation here. Now for the breakup distance, I just want to highlight that the images on the right column are standing for high, ambient, uh, high AGP, the left low AGP. And here we have conventional fuel mixture of alternative and conventional. And here we have the alternative and at the x-axis you can see the distance away from the nozzle and the y-axis is indicating the liquid sheet instability. The three colors here are standing for the nanoparticles concentration in which the blue is the base case. So what we conclude from this graph is peaks of each line indicating high liquid sheet instability meaning that that is the breakup distance. And we noticed that all fuel results were close to each other but the most important finding is that the presence of nanoparticles seem to influence the breakup distance in which it reduces at some cases. Now for the spray velocity, again, we have here high AGP, low AGP, jet A1, mixture of jet A1 and GTL and GTL. We have the Y axis, the velocity and the X axis is the distance away from the nozzle, same color legend. And the important finding here is that nanofuels have higher velocities velocities decrease as AGP increase and we have a high decline rate at high AGP. Now for the conclusion, we concluded that the nanoparticles affect near nozzle spray performance in which it influenced the breakup distance and increased the liquid sheet velocity. Now for the cone angle, the change was marginal. And I just want to emphasize that this work highlights the effect, the effect of adding nanoparticles on jet fuel spray performance which needs to be considered while evaluating the implication of those particles while doing uh, studies regarding the combustion stage. Now for post-project plans, we want to investigate different nozzle geometries to see their effect on the cone angle. And we want to elevate the experimentation phase from spraying to the combustion phase. For the outcomes of this project, we were able to publish a paper at 2018 at the proceedings of ASME. We participated in an annual meeting via poster and an abstract. And as for myself, I used, uh, I added two more fuels. That basically, those are the two of the three that I mentioned here uh, to submit a uh, thesis statement to Texas A&M University College Station and got awarded by a medallion and university level distinction. Also, just yesterday, we received our acceptance for publishing our second paper and hopefully it will be online soon. Now for the acknowledgement, we want to thank QNRF for this Europe award. Without it, this project would have been possible. And we want to thank Shell and QJET uh, for providing the fuels needed for the study. Thank you. 
for listening. And if you have any question, I'll be glad to answer. Yeah. <clears throat> um, thank you, Reem. Uh, I would ask Dr. Drop to raise his question right now. Well, the first. Thank you, Reem, and, and excellent work. Congratulations on those papers and, and uh, very, uh, very clear presentation. Thank you very much. <coughs> My question was on the selection of the aluminum oxide particle, mm -hmm. and uh, if you can articulate why aluminum oxide was selected versus anything else. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So basically, we tried to, we chose aluminum oxide because it was environmentally friendly and it was cheaper. We were able uh, to obtain it in quantities to, for the study. And also we tried the different types of uh, nanoparticle, which is iron oxide, but it tends to settle very fast at the bottom of the sample. So basically the aluminum oxide seemed to be the best candidate, like having the size of 13 microns. And uh, in terms of cost, in terms of environmentally friendly, and uh, in terms of the size. So. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you very much. And I'll stick to one question per, per judge. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Um, thank you, uh, Dr. Rudrov, and thank you, Arim. Uh, next is Dr. Hisham. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hisham. Thank you, Arim, for a very interesting uh, and contentful presentation. Uh, one question, if I may. Uh, you, you, your hypothesis was correct in terms of uh, the, the effect of the spray uh, the effect of the, um, and you've proven uh, the, the effect of uh, adding nanoparticles to uh, enhance the spray characteristics. But the spray characteristics uh, is but one of many factors affecting combustion and indeed the engine performance in, in, overall. Uh, there is of course uh, the question of deposition of nanoparticles uh, and the effect of that on the performance the, and the surfactants and so forth. So have you given any thought to uh, the effect of adding nanoparticles and surfactants uh, to the overall combustion process mm -hmm. and indeed the, the, the performance of the engine, including heat transfer and other factors. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So basically from what we studied, like even from the literature, we found that uh, those change like in terms of the surfactant and the nanoparticles won't, uh, I'm sorry, it's only the surfactant that wouldn't change the chemical uh, characteristics of the fuel. But the, the presence of nanoparticles will, all, will affect the, both the physical and the chemical uh, characteristics of the fuel. So we didn't concentrate so much into the surfactants because since it was reported already in the literature that it wouldn't uh, make that big much of change into the combustion process. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, in, in part, thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you both. Uh, Dr. Gerard? Sorry, I was going to ask a similar question for Dr. Drew, which is, um, that's understandable. She, she answered that question why she didn't try to do, to use different nanoparticles instead of the variable to be the type of the fuel. Uh, and I, I, I wish she showed that some of her uh, results regarding that because um, probably different type of nanoparticles would have different performance in different types of fuels, even though she chose uh, aluminum oxide. So I will encourage her in the post project uh, to try different nanoparticles and uh, as Dr. Hisham to mix them with different surfactants and study them in more comprehensive way. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Jarrar. Um, uh, Dr. Hatton, please. Yeah, uh, thank you for this uh, informative uh, presentation. Uh, now we will suppose you are discussing, discussing with uh, your friend, which is not an engineer, mm -hmm. and you have to explain to him without using technical words, the main idea to keep in mind uh, as an outcome of this research mm -hmm. and the benefits to Qatar. How do you will present this? in a few words. Um, basically, this project fills the knowledge gap regarding the novel nanotechnology in terms of using it to enhance the jet fuel uh, 
the in general enhanced performance of jet fuels. So basically, as being a part of the research community, each research study is complementing the previous studies done before. And it is our job to carry, like, add and carry on pro from uh, what we uh, read and found in the literature regarding uh, the previous findings of uh, this nanotechnology. It's, um, it's still a new technology and probably it's ne it needs more than 50 years to be implemented at the pilot stage. All what is being studied are still in the laboratory scale. So there is nothing uh, for the aviation part at least. I know there is some kind of uh, implementation at pilot scale for uh, like car, uh, the car fuels, but there is nothing on the pilot scale regarding aviation fuels for this technology. Does that answer your question? Partially, but it's okay. Thank you. Still, we have uh, three minutes left. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you all. Uh, thank you, Reem. Um, the next up, I would like to invite Surur University to present the research project titled Synthesis and Size Optimization of Functionalized Silica and Magnetic Core Nanoparticles using chemometric impacts on the removal of pesticides from contaminated water samples. Yes, Surur. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Surur. And today I will be responsible for presenting our project, which is synthesis and size optimization of functionalized silica and magnetic core nanoparticles using chemometrics impacts on the, uh, on the removal of pesticides from contaminated water samples. The primary research mentor was Dr. Marul Azazi with the help of Dr. Khaled, Professor Bassem, Dr. Mahmoud, Dr. Ahmed, and Ms. Maitha. And for my partners, uh, Aya, Noor, we am Fatma, and Maha. Uh, first of all, I will go through explaining the rationale, then I will show the objectives. After I explain the experimental work and the methods used for this work, and then I will go through the results and discussion, and then through the conclusion, and finally through the acknowledgements. As we know, over the past few years, more interest can be seen for nanoparticles and their life uh, and their life uh, applications, especially for nanoparticles with magnetic properties. And also, as we know, water security represents a top priority in Qatar, and the desalination process is very expensive, which puts the certified laboratories that target the ultra-low organic contaminants in a challenge. As a research objective, uh, we, uh, our uh, research objectives were to synthesize functionalized core shell nanoparticles that has the highest magnetic properties, the lowest uniform particle size, and the lowest homogeneous particle size distribution. After the synthesized nanoparticles were applied to magnetic sulfate extraction uh, for pesticides. For the synthesis uh, model, we used two main methods. The first was modified MOSBIR method for making the core. And then we use the stubber method for making the coating. The full factorial design was used uh, with a total of four variables to be tested as shown in table one, which are the tetra ortho, uh, triethyl ortho silicate, ammonia concentration, the dose of iron oxide, and finally the addition mode. And a total of three responses were measured, which are, uh, which are the highest magnetic properties, smallest particle size and the narrowest particle size distribution. For the experimental work, uh, at the beginning, we introduced iron plus two and iron plus three with a ratio of one to two. They, both of them were added to 1.5 molar of an AOH solution at a temperature of 70 degrees Celsius in order to make the core. And before the coating process, fresh one molar solution uh, of TOS and uh, in ethanol was prepared. After this mixture was mixed with uh, water and ammonia and TMS was used as a precursor. And finally, one microliter of uh, this uh, prepared sample was injected in gas chromatography chromatogram for testing. A total two samples were prepared. The first was with a target uh, particle size, which is 100 nanoparticle, and the second with a target of 20 nanoparticle. 
uh, table two shows the scenario for the design matrix. The experiment was run a total of 20 times. In each run, different amount of the four variables was applied, and each variable was assigned to a specific code, as shown in the table here. Uh, as we use the two power four, the full, factor, full factorial design, a total of 16 runs come from this design, and the rest of four runs uh, are used for central points. After that, Pareto chart was used to study the influence of our four variables. As we can see, all the variables exceed the reference line, which is shown in red, with, uh, which shows uh, that our variables are statistically significant. For example, as we can see, TOS has positive impact on the particle size and particle size distribution. In contrast, in our case, ammonia uh, had was statistically insignificant in case of magnetic properties. Uh, also, in our work, it was interesting that the effect of TOS was not absolute and it has a variable effect. This was concluded when the ratio between TOS and iron oxide was studied using the mapping of magnetic uh, properties pattern to see its effect on the magnetic properties. As it's shown in the left panel uh, here, when the ratio was 0 0.25, it gives the highest magnetic property. And in the right panel, matrix plot, uh, plot for the three responses measured against the three numerical values was done. In this figure, a 2D contour plot and surface plot were used to study the variation in magnetic property. As we can see, the highest magnetic properties at TOS concentration was between 0 0.2 and 0 0.3, and for the yield, that is between 0 0.4 and 0 0.5 grams. After that, optimization plot was used to show the effect of the four variables on the three responses and to figure out the optimum conditions for them, as shown in red. Uh, the horizontal lines here signify the three responses, and the upright lines represent the optimal settings for each variable. Uh, the Box-Cox model was used to obtain a mathematical equation that describes the relationship between the responses and the variables. For example, as we can see, TOS has a negative impact in case of uh, uh, has a positive, negative impact in case of magnetic properties, but it has positive impact in case of particle size distribution. And as a summary, our obtained R square uh, was almost close to the predicted R square, which shows the accuracy of our measurements. Uh, in figure five, uh, it, this figure shows the morphology of the obtained nanoparticles. In part A, we can see uh, well-defined particles while in part B, some fused particles are seen. Uh, figure six shows the TGA curve for both samples one and two. Uh, this curve was used to study the thermal behavior of each sample under nitrogen atmosphere. Each sample was prepared in specific condition as shown here in this table. From the TGA curve, we noticed that sample one uh, had weight increase in the region that has a temperature lower than 200, uh, while sample two had weight decrease at the same region. And this showed us that in sample one, the magnetite was not well shielded. Well shielded. In figure seven, uh, in part one, it shows the FTIR spectra for specific samples, and it displays two characteristics uh, peaks at 547 and at 1057, which are related to the magnetite and silica. While in part B, the ratio between absorbances at uh, these two peaks shows a straight line, but we notice two main points that are coming out from the line, which are point A, uh, in which the magnetite was completely separated from the silica, and in point B, in which the error comes from the small minute quantity for both samples. Uh, in figure eight, it shows the gas chromatography chromatogram for carbamates and pesticides in different conditions and the percent of recovery in it uh, as it's shown in this table. And we noticed that sample one was more efficient in ex extracting the pesticides than in sample two. Excuse me. 
Excuse yeah. me, so you have only two minutes left. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, extracting the pesticides, but the recovery percent that is near the predicted percent, which was 40 ppm. As a conclusion, functional R silica and magnetic nanoparticles were prepared using the multiple method for making the core and super method for coating, for making uh, for the coating. And the core factory design was used in order to obtain the condition. And finally, the nanoparticles were applied uh, to remove the pesticides through the magnetic field based extraction. In addition to that, other contaminants were already tested in our lab, such as antimicrobials, and we already started the synthesis of other type of nanoparticles, which are polymethyl, uh, uh, polymethyl acrylate. In addition to that, uh, my work is a part of a big uh, project, and we already submitted a total of four research projects, and we submitted previously two papers in an international conference last year that was held in Turkey. And as an acknowledgement, I we would like to thank all the contributors of this work, uh, especially students, supervisor, as well as QNRF. Also, we would like to thank the Department of Chemistry and Earth Sciences, and special thanks and appreciation to the core labs at the Qatar Environmental and Energy Research Institute. Thank you all, all for your listening, and I would like to hear your questions. Uh, thank you, Stroor. Um, Dr. Amar? Please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Soror. Uh, thank you so much indeed. I have one question. Uh, Soror, you, uh, you went pretty quickly, uh, you dove into the technicalities. Now imagine you are talking to um, uh, a layman person, somebody who is not uh, specialized in, in, in this field. What does this overall presentation uh, tells him or her? What's the relevance? And can we apply something? Can we get something out of this research? Uh, as we know, uh, to in order to have pure water, we apply the desalination process here in Qatar, which is very expensive. So our work was tended to uh, to uh, to synthesize uh, special nanoparticles that will make the same uh, work as we make in desalination process, and to extract these nano uh, these pesticides from the water with less uh, with less uh, costs that as much as we can. Okay, did you, did you cover the cost aspect? Can you talk about it, please? Uh, in the meantime, I don't have a background about the main costs, but what I know is uh, that it just gives a lower cost than the desalination process. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Dr. Munir, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much for the presentation and uh, useful project. Uh, a quick question, uh, I mean, a, a quite interesting finding. I think Qatar University was working with this from, uh, from the, in the past as well. So uh, what was the current status? I mean, did, did you talk to Kaharama how to move forward uh, with, with the outcome of your projects? So now, you know, stand the lab, we tested it. So uh, what's the way forward? I mean, have you, what are, what, what, what are your plans, you know, to talk and go uh, have it implemented in practice? Uh, actually, yes, we did. We talked with Kahrama and we proposed our idea and we hope it will be uh, applied in the future. And uh, we will now we will need to commercialize for this idea and we hope that it will be accepted. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. Dr. Hatem, please go ahead. Uh, Congratulations, Surur, uh, for uh, the presentation and also for uh, the papers. Uh, uh, I'm economist and uh, eco econometrician. I, I saw some uh, I, I, I saw some uh, regression in your presentation, and my concern is about uh, the R uh, square. You have a very high R square, 0 0.99, I think. And uh, my experience told me that uh, when we have such high uh, R, R square, there is uh, some kind of problems and tests to be done. And uh, the main problem in this case are problem of endogeneity. So I ask you to check this problem of endogeneity because I, I didn't understand very well your uh, variables. So I'm not able now to tell you where, uh, 
where I come from this uh, uh, problem of uh, endogeneity. Thank you. Uh, uh, in our case, the R square that we obtained <coughs> was almost close to the uh, uh, to the predicted R square, and uh, it shows that it's not uh, this model is not overfitted, and uh, also we had some problems while working with uh, the model uh, that we used. Uh, but as an indication, we just used the obtained R square to see whether our uh, experimental values are correct or if there is a problem with them yes i, I understand okay but uh, take a look to this uh, this point in particular problem of endogeneity okay okay thank you uh any more questions no so thank you Surur. thank you um judges I will go and now I would like to invite Indra Guana Wan from Qatar University to present uh, a flexible organic photothermal galvanic cells for low power generation. Share, uh, please, uh, Indra, share with us your presentation. Indra, please uh, mute, uh, unmute yourself as well. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. So my, my name is Indra Gunawan. So I'm going to talk about my project. I'm going to make it full screen now. Okay. I'm going to start the presentation now. So my presentation is about flexible organic photothermal galvanic cells for low power generation. So my name is Indra Gunawan, and I, um, I was working with this project with the uh, my colleague Abdurrahman, Maimuna, Tasneem, Manal, Khalid, and Razan is my colleague. And then this project is under the supervision of Dr. Zubair Ahmed. I'm working uh, under Qatar University under the Center of Advanced Materials under the project. So I'm, I'm gonna go ahead to the, to the project aim. The aim of this project is to make sure the research to develop the skills for the undergraduate students, such as myself, the study of the concept of thermoelectric and fabricate the fabrication of flexible thermoelectric cell using organic material, such as vanadyl compound, as this compound. So to, and this is an electrolyte to improve the energy conversion efficiency at the reduced cost. So why do we use these organic materials? Because in this in the recent studies there's like a lot of like high cost materials to to gender to to fabricate this um, uh, i'm sorry this uh, materials my focus is on the thermoelectric materials so before they use the inorganic now i'm going to focus on organic semiconductor because they're eco they're more eco-friendly they're more eco economical and then they're renewable uh, and then they're ergonomet ergonometallic. And the advantage of using this orga organic semiconductor, orga organic materials, is because their flexi uh, flexibility and their lightweight and then the adjustable size and the lower cost. They're so much lower cost than the inorganic materials. So, and also in terms of the, to save the environment, because this is like the main uh, objective uh, for uh, generating energy, because uh, the organic uh, materials, they don't admit any carbon footprints and they're not inflammable and then they're, they're very stable in terms of thermally and then electrochemically. So I'm gonna move forward to the experimental procedure. So as you can see, uh, the tube, this is the, what we use is... Uh, uh, excuse me, Andrew, I think, excuse, excuse me, Andrew, I think... Yes? Dra, excuse me. I think you have some problem with the internet from your side. I'm not sure. My internet is fine. Okay, go ahead, please. Okay, my the experimental side is what we do is we we cut the droplets, uh, it's a polymer, and then we extract the carbon the carbon uh, from uh, the battery, the double A battery. So we put in one side and then we uh, 
uh, we but we glue it with the epoxy, and then we 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 put our materials inside. The materials is the the phenyl compound, and then we as an electrolyte, and then we dissolve it in two in two uh, solvents such as uh, chloroform and acetone. Uh, and then after that, we put all the materials inside the, the tube, as you can see in here. As you can see, this one is after the, the solution, uh, after the solution uh, injected inside the, the polymer. And then we close it with another carbon electrode on the other side. And then what, how we test it is, you can see in here, but it's not pretty clear, but if we zoom in, we put one side of the carbon electrode inside the oil. Why do we use oil? Is because the oil is made to make a proper heat distribution and stability. And then on the other, the other carbon electrode, we put it in the in the room temperature. So there is there is there is a change in temperature there. There are the in the for the oil in the in the bowl of oil in the beaker, we heat it up in under like you know it's going to be on the heater. So we heat it up. So there will be a delta T. Delta T is consists of T of a reference temperature, and then uh, and then the temperature of the heater. So in that in that case, there is the, the delta T. The room temperature we put it as twenty four degrees Celsius. So and then all and then we change it different different temperature, different delta T, and we measure it based on against the delta voltage, the, the potential difference. And as we can see the results here, the, the you can see in the for there is two graph, and there is two tables. One is for the chloroform, and the other one is for acetone. The chloroform we can see here delta uh, the correlation. We made a correlation between delta V against delta T. And you can see we, it has the slope of 0.0662. And then you can see the R square 0.932. This is because of the line of best fit. This is shows that all the points are close to each other, which having like the higher point of the R square is the better. Uh, uh, and then the, as you can see from here, so we made a correlation, uh, the difference between delta T and the delta V. I chose here because you can see in here there is 37 degrees Celsius. At 37 degrees Celsius, the cell can generate 14.44 millivolt. And then for the as for acetone, the same case, but acetone has a better best uh, line of best fit since the R square is higher, 0 0.98. And then as you can see, also 37 degrees Celsius. At 37 degrees Celsius, it can generate 20.7 millivolt. So I'm going to explain why I choose 37 degrees Celsius in general, because 37 degrees Celsius is our body heat, is our body temperature. So it's better. In the so in the conclusion, I can say is that the thermal electric conductivity of the final electrolyte solution is done. And then there is the optimal, but there is more uh, optimization stage that I needs to be done because this is just a small part of a bigger project. Because we are, I have another project under NPR and under NPRPA, and then the internal grant of Q Qatar University I have uh, for the ther ther uh, thermal electric uh, cells EEC, and this is just a, a smaller part of the project. So there is need to be another future work more done like. More solvent needs to be tested and everything, so we can find. But just from this project, I can say is acetone having the most outstanding data because it, it generates more voltage. So this one is, is for low power generation generator. So you can use it like for your watch, and then you can use for your phone. So you know, like this waste heat energy you can turn to electricity. And it can be used. It's very. Um, I believe it's very useful in our our daily life because, like you know, to power our watch instead of we use the sodium battery, we can use the this this cell, the, the thermal uh, electric cell, the, the the generator. I'm sorry. 
like for our watch and we can just put it against our body heat and then it can generate some power. So I would like to thank. Uh, excuse me, Andra, you have two minutes left. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I would like to thank uh, my, uh, send my acknowledgement to, to uh, Qatar Foundation, QNRF, for this project, for the opportunity to work on this project. And then I would like to thank Dr. Zuber for his uh, supervision. I would like to thank uh, the, the lab in Center of Advanced Materials and Qatar University. And I would like to thank all my friends that helped me in this project. And thank you. And that's all my presentation. Thank you so much. I would like uh, to hear your your feedback and uh, questions. Uh, thank you, Indra. Uh, I will start with Dr. Hisham. Hi, Indra. Dr. Hisham. Many thanks for the presentation. Um, uh, I have uh, one question. Could you speak perhaps to the, um, if you've done any work on calculating the efficiency of conversion from heat to electricity, and how does that compare uh, if you had benchmarked against, say, photocells and similar technologies? Yes, uh, thank you for the question, the third. Uh, I didn't do any efficiency tests on this, uh, on this the, the TEG, the, the thermoelectric generator, but for sure, the third, in terms of efficiency, because I also now I'm working on solar cell also. So up in solar cell, I'm going depth in the efficiency. Like just compare to solar cells. Of course, solar cells give a better efficiency and generate more power. But we're talking here about the cost. Compared to like compared this thermoelectric with the solar cell, in terms of the price, it's not even in the same page. Like for the solar cell, I'm pretty sure it's more expensive. So to generate more energy for sure solar cell, but for its class, the T the, the thermoelectric, I think this one is like it gives a decent amount of energy to generate some low power. Uh, devices, but but you have to understand that the the the, the unit cost of, of energy is also related strongly related to the efficiency, so uh, the, you cannot dissociate the two. This is yes. just a, a piece of. Uh, yes, Nefer, thank you so much. I will I will I will go I will go in depth in this. I will move move forward. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Hisham. Uh, Dr. Gerard, please go ahead. Yes, yes, thank you. Um, thank you for this presentation. Uh, I was wondering, uh, I know you mentioned why you use the 37 degree to evaluate the performance of your cell. Uh, so what do you think the, yani, the point I'm trying to, are you thinking uh, for future medical applications on a human body for this cell? What kind of application you would think to do? That's one point. The second point, did you uh, evaluate the performance of your cell at other temperatures? Because you mentioned that to use it in um, phones or clocks and, and so on, and that's different than 37 would be naturally. So what do you think? Yes, uh, Dr. thank you for the questions. Uh, I mentioned about the applications uh, for watch. I mean, like as you can see in the graph, it's not just 37. Like you can see the graph, I will go back to the graph. To the result. So you can see this is delta T. So delta T is the is consists of uh, delta T is T reference, which is because when I measure it, there is two types of measure. There is one carbon electrode is in the beaker, which it, the, the the temperature difference, and then the other side of the carbon electrode is the room temperature. So as you can see in the delta T is actually whatever the uh, room temperature in that case, in that time and the moment it was 24. And I increase the left. They need money or left? Oh, okay. Sorry. Uh, yeah. So and then uh, and then you change the the temperature of the heater. So in that case, there is delta T then. So there there will be like <coughs> a different type of temperature in the graph. It's not just thirty seven degree. As you can see, if it's like if it's like sixty degree Celsius, you will generate more power. It will be like more like sixteen millivolt, for example. I'm just making uh, an example as a, like as a, your watch because you 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 put your watch in your body like in your hand on your wrist so it can generate power if you use the thermoelectric wow. generator. So do you know the boiling point for acetone and chloroform? 
Chloroform. And how that will affect your cell performance if it's the temperature raised? Excuse me, Dr. Gerrard, and excuse me, Dr. Gerrard. Uh, uh, can I shift the questions to Dr. Drove and the Dr. Omar? Well, Thank you very much. Answer this question if you want. <laughs> Is it a short answer, Andra? I will take that. <laughs> Please, we will uh, go with Dr. Uh, Drov now. Yeah, thank you very much, Andrea, and, and um, a nice presentation and, and very good work. Thank you. Um, a question for you, which is very similar to Dr. Hisham's and, and very simple one, is do you know of any commercial applications of thermoelectric generation at this point? And is it applicable to, for example, heat recovery from LNG, which gives you a huge delta T? All right, uh, LNG, I'm not sure about LNG, doctor, but I made some experiments on how to turn, uh, you can use in uh, turning like water vapor into, a, uh, into water, it's, a, it's like defrosting of water. I can use that, but LNG, it, because the, the temperature will be so high, I don't think it will be applicable into to my, to this typical uh, specific project. I don't think so, because I believe because Dr. Uh, Dr. Jarar was asking me about the temperature of the, the boiling point, just like if let's say we choose acetone because it, it generates more energy in a certain temperature. If you use acetone, acetone boiled at around 150. So if it's like, if it's boiled, it will destroy the cell. So I don't think it will be like high temperature. I don't think this is for like a very high temperature. Thank you, Drove. Thank you, um, Indra. Uh, the next is Dr. Omar, and the last question, please. This Thank is you. the last. <coughs> Thank you, Indra. Uh, Indra, if I base myself on slide number two, uh, you opted to, to work on that compound and to check the cost effectiveness of conversion at mild temperature while not emitting carbon and flammable and being thermally and electrochemically stable. Uh, but what I saw in the next slides, and as you uh, nicely presented, you only worked on the electric conductivity. So unless you, you, you did not present the results of those, have you really done work about the cost effectiveness and emission of carbon, et cetera, et cetera? Um, I only did uh, in terms of the electrical stability, but in terms of the thermal stability, we didn't have enough time to work on it. Uh, but it will have, like, I will, uh, I have an idea to, to work on the thermal stability. But just this project, I just work on the electrical stability, if that's answer your question. Doctor, if I may, could I just give a piece of advice very quickly, not a question. Go ahead, go ahead, thanks. Uh, Indra, you, you realize, of course, that 37 degrees is the, is the uh, blood temperature, not the skin temperature. Uh, so applications such as powering uh, wristwatches and so forth will not be based on that temperature. So this is something that you might want to consider. Yes, yes, you have a really good point. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're done with Indra. I hope you get something from the judges um, to continue your work. And uh, I'd like now to um, invite the team from Texas A&M University at Qatar comprising the three um, uh, individuals, Jamil Patista, Abdel Sattar, Al Kahla, and Abdel Karim Mohammed, uh, to present the research titled "Will Bore Cleaning Prior to Completion Utilization Utilizing Surfacent Combinations." And I think Jamil is gonna do yes. the presentation. Thanks. Okay, um, good morning, everyone. My name is Jeremiel Bautista. I am a petroleum engineering senior uh, representing Texas A&M University of Qatar to present a research project on Mulberg cleaning utilizing surfactants. Now, this project was under the supervision of Dr. Mahmoud Amani and our laboratory mentor, Arnel Carvero, along with my two colleagues, Abdul Karim Mohammed and Abdul Zatar al -Kahala. Now, this is a project targeting specific concerns that regularly occur within the drilling phase in oil and gas production. And we strongly believe that the findings from this project 
who will make a great impact on future research on this uh, specific topic and even within the industry. Uh, so in this project, I will be going through our project background, uh, our methodology, then results with discussions, conclusions, future, pra uh, future plans for our project, and finally our acknowledgements to credit those who, ha who have helped our team make this project possible. So now you might be thinking, how or why exactly is this research relevant? Well, in the field of oil and gas production, drilling is one of the most important components of the whole process. Uh, any problems encountered within this stage can further extend drilling time, which in turn can lead to high operation costs. Now, the major problem that our project highlights is that is the buildup of cuttings in the well bore. Uh, this occurs when the drill bit penetrates through the subsurface layers, causing the solids to settle and forming what's called a cuttings bed, which you could refer to on the schematic on the right side. Now, if these cuttings are left untreated, several consequences will come into play including a reduction in, pen in penetration rate, the formation of fractures, premature bit wear, and increased drill string torque and drag, which could damage the drill string. Now to fix this problem, petroleum engineers would have to conduct what's called well bore cleaning, which is the process of transporting the cuttings from the bottom of the well all the way up to the surface. And re now relating that to our project, our main objective is to optimize for a method and chemical solution that, not, that have not been investigated in previous research papers that would most effectively clean the wellbore during drilling operations. So first, I would like to briefly go through our designed uh, experimental plan. First, we looked at two conditions that we simulated in the lab, which are static and dynamic. Now, static conditions represent wellbore cleaning that is being conducted while the drill string is not operating. And the opposite is for dynamic conditions, which simulates wellbore cleaning while drilling is happening. And onto chemical solutions, we decided on two solvents that are readily available to rig sites, which are drill water and seawater. Then finally, based on past research and what is currently being used during drilling operations, we decided on using caustic soda, otherwise known as NaOH or sodium hydroxide, and a surfactant called SafeSur. Uh, and these two chemicals are being used as cleaning agents for all sorts of equipment. So here's the table that we followed for our experiments. Uh, it should be noted that every experiment only has one additive and one solvent at one condition. And also the surfactant concentrations that we chose were based on past uh, research recommendations. Now this adds up to a total of 12 solutions and 32 experiments. So here is the summarized procedure plan that we followed for our experiments. First, the mud samples were prepared with a density of 12 pounds per gallon, which is a pretty standard uh, density for uh, rigs. Then small steel pipes used to represent the drill pipe were cleaned and labeled. Uh, then they were placed inside each cell, which were filled with the prepared mud, as you could see in the image on the right. Uh, then these cells were pressurized to 100 PSI, then placed inside a roller oven to be aged for three days or exactly 72 hours. So if the experiment is undergoing static conditions and the roller oven is not turning, and for dynamic conditions, then the rollers in the oven would be turned on. And then after three days, the cell pressure would be discharged from each cell and the pipes were carefully removed and taken pictures of for reference. Now the cleaning solutions were prepared at these concentrations for both drill and seawater. Then each pipe was assigned to be cleaned by one solution using a magnetic stirring rod for five minutes. Uh, each test was repeated three times for accuracy, and so we cleaned a total of 96 samples. So since we do have so many results and dealt with almost 100 samples, I shall be only showing the results for two different experiments. So the first experiment uh, involves steel pipes aged at static conditions and cleaned with a mixture of drill water and caustic soda, or uh, NaOH. Uh, this is a table of before and after pictures uh, for every trial and for every uh, sodium hydroxide concentration. Now what we did was we looked closely at every before and after pair and analyzed how uh, effective the cleaning procedure was. And this second example involves steel pipes aged at dynamic conditions and cleaned with a mixture of seawater and safe surf. And all the other pictures for these for the other experiments can be seen uh, in our research paper if you are interested. Now that we have our results, it is time to analyze them. Uh, these are the observations for the effectiveness of cleaning solutions made with drill water. 
So starting at static conditions, it was observed that as the concentration of sodium hydroxide increased, the amount of rusting on the clean pipe also increased. Uh, it was also observed that the amount of left over sludge on the sides of the pipes have decreased. Now using a safe surf, less rusting was observed, but appeared more greasy. But as the concentration of safe surf increased, the greasiness also uh, decreased. Now at dynamic conditions, more bubbles were observed on the sides of the pipes, but significantly less greasy. Uh, and it was also observed that the pipes were more effectively cleaned as compared to the static condition. And uh, figure one shows a sample that has undergone these dynamic conditions. So this is what we have observed for the samples cleaned using seawater. Uh, for static conditions, it was again observed that the amount of rusting increased as NaOH concentration increased. And additionally, no trace of mud was left specifically on the upper section of the pipes. Um, and then for, as for safe surf, the cleanliness increased with increased uh, safe surf concentration. At dynamic conditions, due to the continuous rota rotating uh, movement, there was minimal sludge that settled on the surface of the pipes, and there was also minimal rusting observed. So in general, more rusting was observed with safe surf as compared to NaOH. And uh, cleaning samples that underwent dynamic conditions were much easier to clean than those aged at static conditions. So in this presentation, I went through the importance of drilling operations, which are commonly interrupted by the plugging of cuttings within the wellbore area, which, increasing, which increases the operation time, hence operation costs. Uh, in this project, we experimented uh, with two different kinds of conditions, solvents and additives, to find the optimal method for wellbore cleaning with minimal risks involved. Uh, the steel pipes undergone either static or dynamic conditions, and each was cleaned with one of 32 prepared clean solutions, which total up to 96 clean samples. So here are the three main observations that the team had after we got the results. Uh, first, uh, seawater was generally more effective in cleaning out the grease and mud off the pipes as opposed to drill water. Uh, safe surf was more effective in removing contaminations in comparison to sodium hydroxide. And number three, pipe samples that were aged in dynamic conditions were easier to clean in, in contrast to those uh, aged in static uh, conditions. Jeremy, Jeremy, yes. excuse me, you have two minutes, two minutes left. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Therefore, the optimum wellbore cleaning conditions as a result of this project was a cleaning solution consisting of seawater with safe surf at dynamic conditions. Now, as for recommendations, it is recommended to further extend on this research by comparing other cleaning agents used in the industry and compare their cleaning potential to those mentioned in the project. Uh, it is also recommended to find specific concentrations of cleaning agents uh, that work the best. So after we have finished our project, we then presented our work at the third uh, EAGE workshop that occurred here in Doha at the end of last year. Uh, this Europe competition was the second opportunity that our team had to uh, present this research, and we are currently also submitting our paper for journal uh, publications. Now, as for possible uh, industrial collaborations, we were thinking of submitting a proposal to North Oil Company, as well as service companies su uh, such as Schlumberger and Baker Hughes, who may also benefit from our findings. Now, before I end this presentation, our team would like to thank Europe, uh, Qatar Foundation and QNRF for giving us the Europe Award that enabled us to start this research. And of course, the opportunity to represent our research to such a prestigious panel. And we also send our gratitude to Texas A&M at Qatar for providing the laboratory space and equipment used. Uh, our team has devoted so much energy and time on this project, and we hope that our findings will be beneficial for professionals, for professionals within academia and the industry. And that is our project, and we thank you for listening, and I am now open to your questions. Uh, thank you, Jeremel. Um, I think I'll start with Dr. Munir. Dr. Munir. Thank you very much for the interesting presentation and uh, the outcome uh, uh, of this project. Uh, I just want to go, about, go to the last slide about uh, the, uh, the, you know, the way forward. So uh, uh, there are some, uh, you know, um, initiatives in this area. Uh, in West Africa, there is, uh, you know, uh, even a published uh, uh, in a paper overcoming well, well bore cleanup challenges in deep water wells in West Africa. 
uh, in 2014. And Schlumberger, you mentioned Schlumberger, they have a solution actually called the deep clean uh, solution. So did you compare your approach to what exists already and what's uh, the advantages of your approach compared to the um, other works mm -hmm. being done elsewhere? Thank you. Yeah, so um, how this is different to previous research or what is done in the industry is that we have used additives or surfactants that are re readily available and uh, pretty low in bulk cost. Um, although the exact costs are proprietary and not disclosed. However, we believe that it is not significant compared to other major uh, operation costs. Um, we also know that the solutions that we have prepared in our, our research are also safe to implement to the field and are uh, rather environmentally friendly. Thank you. Dr. Omar, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Jahmil. Uh, you, you simply now talked about the costs and you said it's not significant. Could you please uh, uh, speak about it exactly and uh, if you can give some numbers? Yeah, like you said, um, the exact costs are not available or not disclosed, but um, the fact that we can use it in the lab in our university just shows that it is readily available to anyone. So it can be used in uh, both research and industry. Um, so unfortunately, I do not have exact values to compare with you at the moment, but um, that could be something that we consider uh, later on to do a cost analysis. Uh, thank you. Dr. Dro, go ahead. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, uh, very good work. Thank you. And um, you partially answered my question that uh, you do not know what exactly safe uh, safe surf is um, is that is that correct no um, we do know what safe surf is but we do not know uh, the cost uh, in certain um, in industry proportions which is why I can't so what uh, was so what was missing from this is an excellent piece of experimental work and, and thank you for doing that. I can understand um, uh, the, the logic behind doing this, but I, I would like to also see what is the scientific basis of, uh, of the conclusion in terms of what, um, what you concluded. Um, uh, so what mm -hmm. exactly is happening from a, from a geochemistry perspective geochemistry. or production chemistry perspective? Yeah, so um, that would be a good, uh, extension to this project, but we are looking at this just from the external side. Uh, and like I said in the presentation, we used chemicals that were recommend recommendations from previous research. And so we did not dive into exactly the chemical processes that make it that sort of um, come up with the conclusions that we did. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, excellent. I think that's it. And, uh, thank you, <clears throat> Jeremel. Uh, now, I think the last presentation in the energy and environment is coming from Abdurrahman Mohammed from Qatar University to present a human circulatory system simulation, extracorporeal membrane oxygenation therapy. Um, hello. Welcome. Uh, yes, this is Abdurrahman. I just want to uh, make a note that this is for the ICT. It is not the... Oh. Okay then, sorry, sorry for the mistake. No problem. No. Uh, so shifting I'll... to the ICT pillar, yeah. Uh, um, my name is uh, Abdurrahman uh, Mahmoud, as uh, uh, Dr. Labaidli mentioned. Um, I'm here to present human circulatory system simulation for extracorporeal membrane oxygenation and therapy. Um, uh, I'm presenting on behalf of myself and my team. Uh, my team include my teammates include um, Ayman Abdul Karim, Omran Abdullah, Al Sheikh Muhammad, and our LPI is Dr. Faisal uh, Binti Ali, and um, and our co-PI from HMC is uh, uh, Professor Guillaume Alinier. And um, <clears throat> Uh, for the background, I would like to discuss what is uh, extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, and it's basically short-term uh, artificial uh, artificial hearts and lungs uh, that is used for uh, for supporting a patient that has lung or heart uh, failure, 
And basically what is done is uh, in order to turn on this machine, you have to reroute the blood from the body into the ECMO machine. And it's done in a similar fashion to dialysis where a cannula goes into the body and extracts the blood and passes it over the machine in order to oxygenate it. Um, very recently, as we, as we know, the crisis of uh, COVID-19 has scourged like the, the earth. Um, uh, ECMO was found to be very useful in uh, patients who, that have the problem of um, lung failure as it gives them a chance to recover from uh, the lung failure. Uh, actually, in, even in Qatar, two out of 50 patients are being treated using ECMO the ECMO machine. And um, it's very important to mention that in order to do um, cannulation for the ECMO machine, which is the process of inserting the cannula into the body, there has to be a lot of training as it's very intensive and it's very dangerous. Um, usually uh, in order to train the, the healthcare uh, individuals, um, <clears throat> training is conducted using mannequins uh, uh, that are uh, used in order to simulate or emulate a human body. So here our aim is, uh, is to introduce or, or like um, our, our aim is to create the next generation cannulation simulator, uh, which is a uh, collaborative project between uh, Qatar University and HMC in order to develop and, and uh, emphasize on these four points, uh, cost efficient, realistic, and educationally effective uh, ECMO SBT uh, uh, system, but not just cannulation simulator, but the whole system. So first, um, our simulator composes of multiple parts. Um, uh, uh, there's the patient part, which is the cannulation simulator, what we're working on and what is our scope of the, this exact project. There is also the ECMO machine, which is simulating the ECMO machine itself. And there's simulating the heater uh, in order to, um, to convey all of this or, or, or create this um, full system. So if we go through the literature review, uh, there are three very popular uh, simulators. You have the earlier summer simulator, which is very expensive, costs around 33,000 uh, euros. And then you have, uh, uh, and it has limited anatomical realism. I'll go through this later. And then um, the CK, uh, CK Allen, which has only veins simulation. So it simulates only the veins or the um, uh, veins or one single loop of the blood. And there are the lastly T endo, which simulates in a makeshift way, both loops but, uh, but it also requires an ECMO, a running real ECMO machine in order to operate it, which is very, very expensive. Um, here in our design, we have uh, the, our, our idea of the next generation cannulation simulator, where you have first the closed loops, where, which composes of the tubes that the liquid runs in and the special connectors that are, that are used and also the motors or the pumps that are uh, used are controlled using the controller. We have also the cannulation access points, which are highlighted in dark red. And these are where the cannulas or the insertion of the cannula goes through. And it's very critical in order to simulate or emulate and teach uh, healthcare participants um, how to do cannulation. And then the third part, the procedural emergencies, which is our novelty, which are composed of um, uh, like simulating what could go wrong in a surgery and how to alert the, uh, the instructor if, uh, if, the patient, uh, if the trainee goes through such fault. So uh, our design also has an embedded system aspect in order to actualize all of this. We have um, flow sensors in order to measure, uh, to, to, to measure the, the flow of liquid in the tubes. We have the force sensing resistors in order to is emu uh, emulate the um, internal bleeding case. And then we have DC motors for, uh, for pulsating effect at the ac uh, access points. And then lastly, we have also the, the pumps that actually pumps the blood, uh, the liquid that emulates blood into the system. For the closed loop, we consider, um, as of results uh, for the closed loops, we considered uh, realistic, very realistic diameters uh, for the tubes. Uh, for the arteries and the veins. Uh, and also we 3D printed the realistic uh, connectors in order to make them as realistic or as human-like as possible. 
And uh, thirdly, we also generated pulsatile flow for arteries and laminar flow for veins in order to emulate exactly how the, the, the whole uh, pumping of blood happens in the body. The cannulation access points um, are, as I said, uh, a focal point in our, in our project because cannulation is as important, uh, like cannulation is, the, is our topic and the insertion of the cannula is the most sophisticated uh, procedure of cannulation. Uh, so first we made the mold in order to, um, to make the, the, the access point. And then we designed it based on ultrasound image of the femoral uh, area in order to emulate where the cannulation happens and the femoral usually and the jugular. Uh, and then after we made the mold, we basically uh, poured in ultras uh, ultrasoundable uh, material, which is um, Ecoflex in order to, to emulate the human touch and also uh, in order to uh, make the material see-through with ultrasound, which is the guiding method in cannulation usually. For the procedural emergencies, we have implemented two methods of procedural emergency. Internal bleeding, which, is, which happens when the cannula goes into the simulated renal vein, uh, renal vein. and uh, you, typically when this happens, there will be internal bleeding and the patient might die. So we're trying to emulate it in order to, to, let, uh, to make the, uh, the lecturer uh, aware of this uh, in case it happens. And bleeding using the flow meter is basically continuously measuring the flow and uh, detecting how much liquid is lost in the system. So the overall systems of the arterial and the venous loops were connected. The arterial was, uh, had no leaks and ran very nicely. Um, the, uh, the venous loop had minor leaks that we're, we're working on and will continue to work. Um, for discussing the, 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 the results, we, uh, we carried out a, an, um, um, an important test with, with HMC's doctors, ECMO doctors and nurses and perfusionists. Um, we also uh, uh, would like to iterate that our model is uh, is better in terms of realism as it, it, it focuses on the anatomical realism and it shows exactly how uh, a human body would look through an ultrasound. Also, we, we focused on price in order to make the whole system cheap uh, and easy to uh, Abdurrahman, excuse me, Abdurrahman, you have two minutes. Sure, uh, well noted, thank you. Also, immersion, we want to in, uh, immerse the trainee into the tra uh, in the training and may include the lecturer. Uh, some limitations we, we, uh, we bump, bumped in is the 3D printed parts accurate uh, precision because our 3D printers weren't very accurate. Also, we had a problem with the DC pumps precision. Uh, in order for the project, uh, post-project plans, we were intending into improving the performance of the overall system. And also we, we intend to introduce new procedural emergencies like seizure mode and uh, tachycardia. We're also thinking, uh, we're also working on integrating the next generation cannulation simulator with a full uh, environment, where, which includes the, the ECMO machine as well and other things. Uh, and also we, we would like to conduct a conclusive effectiveness study at HMC in order to assess how effective this uh, simulator as that teaching. Uh, we, in, uh, uh, to conclude, we have uh, phase one was fully implemented. Procedure emergencies were tested at, uh, at HMC and QU. And also we have uh, very good incentives from uh, extracorporeal life uh, support organization ELSO when we met them in the symposium organized in Qatar. And um, we've, uh, we've submitted three abstract journals, uh, two IEEE conference papers, and we won two best paper awards uh, in these, uh, in these, in the previous conferences, and we had one full, we have one full journal in progress right now. I would like to thank uh, Engineer Abdullah Selmi for his time and, uh, and effort in uh, assisting us. He worked on the previous uh, part and the ECMO machine itself. Uh, we would like to also thank Dr. Ibrahim Fauzi, uh, the head of the MICU. I would like to thank Dr. Ali uh, Ed Hassan for, uh, and Mrs. Abir Ahmed and Mr. Brian Colado. Uh, and the rest of the HNC ECMO team for their uh, clinical advice and guidance. And um, I would like to thank also um, 
uh, our colleagues that helped, uh, helped us with the 3D printer. And I would like, of course, like, lastly, thank the Europe uh, uh, for this grant and this opportunity in order to share our work uh, with the world and uh, with you. Thanks a lot. I'll be very happy to answer all your questions now. Thank you. Thank you, Abdrahman. Um, uh, Dr. Munir, can you go ahead, please? Yeah, uh, thank you very much for the interesting presentation, interesting work. Um, you. Uh, you mentioned that uh, you have a prototype now, uh, now and you are testing it. Uh, and also you are uh, collaborating with HMC, which is, uh, which is good. Uh, but just uh, I have a comment uh, regarding your comment where you said that our model is better uh, and also the price is, uh, uh, is interesting. It's here, yeah. so, uh, uh, Did you compare, for instance, your approach with uh, another approach by, you know, in Poland, uh, they have a prototype of, of extra corporal membrane oxygenation chemotherapy simulator. Uh, there is a paper published in 2018 in, uh, in uh, yes. PubMed. Uh, so, I mean, uh, I don't know if you are aware of this work. I mean, uh, how, how, how does your work compare to, the, to this work? And uh, uh, in terms yep. of uh, the challenges you are meeting in terms of uh, uh, 3D printing, how you, you are trying to overcome that and have something that is uh, uh, pr pr pricely interesting from price, yes. uh, price perspective. Thanks a lot for your question. Um, it's a very important point. Uh, yes, I am aware of this paper uh, from Poland. Uh, we've, uh, we've checked it out and we've analyzed it. Uh, what they're doing is mostly simulating the whole system, but they don't have some sort of uh, cannulation procedure or cannulation model. So what they're doing is that they have the ECMO machine running and then they, they have some sort of demonstration. But unlike us, we have an actual cannulation access point. So the, the, the trainees uh, can cannulate the system. If you can see through the pictures, like if the ultrasound is already running and there is cannulation. So it's, it's a bit different. We actually included them in our literature review and the report, if you would like to see that. Um, but yeah, uh, as I said, um, our, our project is more uh, intensive and it in actually includes cannulation unlike theirs. Also, another important point is that uh, realism, uh, as I said, we, no one has a similar aspect when it comes to, to simulating anatomical realism using ultrasound images, uh, which is something special that we did. Also, no one has the, um, the aspect of procedural emergencies, which is our novelty idea. Thank you. Yes. Thanks for your question. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hisham. Thank you, Dr. Hisham, please. I raised my hand and then lowered it because the two here. No, not about the paper. I wasn't aware of, still, of the paper, we, but actually we, a comparison and benchmark. No, we again. can receive two more uh, questions. One. But I, I, no I, I would like just to make a comment. I, I very much like the uh, biomimicking aspect of what you did, including the pulsating uh, yes. flow yes. In, in, in the arteries and, and, and the lamina. In, in the, I'm not sure if it's laminar or turbulent, but it's, it's certainly steady. Not, not pulsating in, in, in the veins. Uh, but I like the biomimicking <coughs> aspect of what you did. I think that was very uh, realistic and to be commended. Thank you. I, I would like to comment on that if, if it's possible, Mrs. Uh, Dr. Avedli. Um, okay, uh, thanks a lot yes, for your comment. Just, just go ahead, yes. Um, the, the pulsating effect is only on the arterial side. So this is the ingenuity of what we're doing. If you find uh, in the post, in the final, uh, Simulated, it's only on the arterial side in order to show this pulsating in the arteries, but not in the veins. And actually, when the cannulation is done, this is how the trainees or the actually the healthcare professionals can recognize or identify the arteries from the veins. So this is a very uh, genuine and interesting way in, uh, to teach the trainees how to find the arteries, which is which could be very difficult sometimes. But thanks a lot for your comments and and your okay. insight. Uh, the last question is from Dr. Hatem Mahani. Well done, Abdurrahman. Uh, quite uh, amazing findings. Thank you. Uh, uh, I consulted the final report of this project, and I uh, noticed that uh, among all the students who took part in this research, uh, Ayman uh, Abdul Karim was the one who really performed very well. Do you agree with me? Thank you. Uh, yeah, we all work together and um, uh, it's not in question who worked better than others. Uh, what's question is 
uh, did we finalize the project and did we work all as a team? And this is the most important and essential part of our project. So I uh, wasn't the first one. As we're the, all we're all we're all the same. We're all working together. <laughs> thank you, Doctor Hatem. It's a teamwork, I think. Um, yes, thank you. It's a teamwork effort, and uh, I'd like to emphasize on how important it is to have different insights. Actually, our team was was medic, uh, was uh, mechanical engineers and electrical engineers, and it was very important to coordinate together and work together in order to achieve this and um, uh, show a really good product in the end. It was important to hear you telling us this. <laughs> thank you, Doctor. Uh, thank you, Abdrahman. And I hope this is a learning experience for all of you joining us today. Uh, now, I would like also to invite Neher from Qatar University to present the research project titled Development of Independently Controlled Four Wheel Drive System for Autonomous Electric Vehicle. Hello, good afternoon, everybody. I'll just mm -hmm. share my screen. Uh, just a minute, there seems to be a problem. Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Aisha, and good afternoon, everybody. Today, I am Neheja, and I'll be the development, uh, development of independently controlled four-wheel drive systems for autonomous electric vehicle on behalf of my teammates, Aya, Ajit, Jason, and Mohammed. So let's have a look at the outline. We'll first go through the introduction and look at the goals and the objectives of the project. Later, we will proceed with the design and implementation, followed by the system integration. And finally, we would arrive at the conclusion and the future work. In the transport sector, a clear trend towards electric vehicle is visible. This is due to several reasons, such as increasing climate change concerns, along with the drive to reduce the dependence of, on fossil fuels instead of and instead switching to green alternatives. There are several advantages of electrical vehicles compared to that of internal combustion engines, such as simple design, high efficiency, and quick acceleration. We set out to achieve three goals to enable the development of independently controlled four-wheel vehicles. So those are design of electrical vehicle, implementation of four-wheel drive system, and semi-autonomous operation. In order to achieve these objectives, we began by selecting the necessary components for the project. To determine the control parameters, modeling and simulation of some of the system components was carried out. Next, we implemented the hardware and the embedded in for the motor drive system, and finally integrated the system to enable semi-autonomous operation. So let's have a look at each of these steps in details. We carefully scrutinized several components to select best fit for the project. One of the most important components for electrical vehicle is the type of the motor. We chose PLDC motor due to the several advantages such as high efficiency, wide speed range, fast dynamic response, among the others. Several other um, components such as controllers, inverter switches were chosen by a similar process. Unfortunately, due to the limited duration of the pr presentation, the details of these components will not be discussed. Uh, in the next step, we developed several simulation models. First, we began with developing a road emulation model. This helped us understand the behavior of the road and other load on the vehicle. From this analysis, we were able to determine the power rating required for the motor. Second, we mathematically developed a dynamic model of BLDC machine to use the motor simulation. Finally, we utilized the BLDC dynamic model to simulate a motor uh, system. This was done in open as well as in closed loop. The layout of the system. Let me just use a pointer to, yes. So layout here represents the uh, layout of the system. And here you can see the acceleration input from the driver is applied to the controller via a potentiometer that is from VCC. And then depending on the input of the controller, the controller controls the switches of the gate drive, which in turn regulates the inverter. The inverter then supplies the energy necessary to drive the motor either in, in the required direction and at required speed. 
To realize the previously mentioned system layout, several hardware components were designed. This include the inverters, the gate drivers, voltage and current sensors, along with the controller docking station. So let's ha have a look at the designs of the, each of these components. So these are the designs for the inverter and the gate driver. And these are the designs for the current and voltage sensors. And we also made PCBs for each of these components and also the inverter board. So this is the PCB for the inverter board, and this is the PCB for the docking station. The controller was then uh, controller was programmed to enable operation in open loop as well as in closed loop. However, due to the several inadequacies of the open loop operations, such as inability to control autonomously the uh, electrical vehicle, a closed loop program was uh, developed. The flowchart of these programs have been shown here. In order to test the valid operation of the system, the hardware and the embedded systems were interfaced together. And the plot here shows the desired operation of the inverter gates based on the three Hall effect sensors. And these are the inverter gate signals. As you can see, these are the gates, Q1, Q2, Q3, and so on. After having one of the motor systems verified for optimal operation, we integrated four of these switches together to form four wheel electrical vehicle. Each of these controllers were controlled via a master controller, which receives steering control and acceleration input. The integration of the system was critical as all the motors must, perform, must be perfectly synchronized to achieve the desired operation under different conditions. So in this figure, you can see the master controller and these are the slave controllers. Here you can see the zoomed out picture of the realistic model that we have developed in the lab. And yes, uh, in order to enable semi-autonomous operation, a GUI, a graphical user interface with the help of lab view was developed. There are two modes in the GUI. One is the test mode, another one is the run mode. In the test mode, you can verify the working of individual motor, as you can see here in the screen above. And on the contrary, on the bottom, you can, in the run mode, you can see the functioning of the whole vehicle as an entity. This GUI facilitates the wireless connection with the master controller. Hence, the vehicle can be remotely controlled. And these are the waveforms from the car. These are the current waveforms. So the plot here shows four current waveforms derived from four different motors under load and no load operation. There, here the load represents the nature of the load, such as resistive forces offered by the road, while no load condition represents the operation of the car on the test bench with no ground contact. As expected, the current drawn is high under no load operation and that of, as that of compared with the no load operation. So this is the load operation and this is the no load operation. As you can see, the current here is higher compared to the current here. To show the independence of the motor, let's name two car motors as pink and green. In this figure, yellow curves represents the voltage of the motor, while the green and pink curves represent the current that is drawn by the green and pink motor respectively. So as you can see here, the, car, the motors are running in forward direction, both of them, the green and the pink motor. However, here, we have reversed the direction of the pink motor and you can see the current waveform have, has reversed for the pink motor and not for the green motor. So we can this way determine the independent working of the motors. So let's have a closer look by having a look at this presentation, this video. Doesn't work. Okay, so I'm just gonna play it with Here you can see this wheel is moving forward ahead in, uh, sorry, this wheel is moving in the reverse direction while this wheel is moving in the forward direction. So you can see these motors are not coupled together. Moving on with the next, uh, Control. Here we can see this is a test result where the car is remotely controlled and steered. So the car moves forward as it is remotely controlled and it is steered also remotely. To have an even better understanding, let's look at the control of the car with the developed GUI. Here the front wheel facilitate the steering while the rear wheels, ena rear wheels enable the forward movement of the car. So as you can see, the mouse cursor is pressing on the right and the car steers towards the right here. And then we would move towards the left. So we would press left and the car moves towards the left. So 
To sum it up, we have realized the design of electrical vehicle. In addition, we were able to implement the four wheel drive system, which enables synchronous control of the motor. So here, none of the wheels are uh, mechanically connected by, via our shaft as in a regular vehicle that you would see. And then finally, we were able to implement the semi-autonomous operation of the vehicle. With the help of the developed GUI and wirelessly interfacing these with, this with the micro con, uh, master microcontroller. So having a look at the bigger picture, many future improvements could be carried out. This includes the integration of the system for path tracking um, and an obstacle sorry, avoidance. Sorry, you have two minutes left. Okay, thanks. Excuse me, you have two minutes left, thanks. Yes. Uh, uh, so yeah, so having a look at the bigger picture, many future improvements could be carried out. This includes the integration of systems for path tracking and obstacle avoidance, where the integration of GPS could be enabled to enable position tracking in autonomous mode. Advanced driver assistance systems along with intelligent speed adaption systems could be integrated to facilitate improved performance. So in the end, we would like to thank our supervisors and our engineers and electrical engineering department for their support and motivation. In addition, we'd also like to thank the National Research Fund for the Europe grant for this project. And thank you, I'm open for questions. Thank you, Dr. Munir, please go ahead. Dr. Munir. Yeah, thank you very much for the interesting presentation and uh, the prototype. Um, I have uh, a question regarding uh, what, what will happen, for instance, if uh, uh, the motors, uh, I think they are brushless motors, if they mm -hmm. go out of sync, uh, if one of the controllers fail, uh, did you uh, uh, imagine to have a, a, a redundancy mechanism or a redundant circuits, redundant controller to avoid that? And uh, yes? Yeah, as of now, we don't have a redundant controller because we were just trying to implement the concept as it is to see if it actually works in reality. So further developments could be done to ensure safety. Safety was not a main concern because we were trying to first implement the concept itself. Uh, well, can I ask another question? Yes, please go ahead. Uh, so uh, what, what's your, uh, your plan? I mean, how, how do you, I mean, you're, you're planning to uh, implement this in, in practice. Are you uh, going to get in touch with the car manufacturers? There, there is some work done in, in Spain at the University of Seville are you in touch with them, uh, other initiatives worldwide? Uh, as of no now, uh, oh, sorry, because uh, we have all, all the teammates from the project have started on different uh, projects of their own. So one of them was doing masters, for example, I'm also doing masters and we are not in the same place, unfortunately. So I'm in Germany, for example, so we're not able to coordinate very well. So, but we are planning to do something forward again when we get the opportunity for it. As of now, no. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Hatem, please go ahead. Um, uh, I will use uh, some crude words uh, for this, uh, assessing this project, this proposal. Um, if I tell you that this is really useless and that I see no interest in doing this research, what would you answer me? Well, uh... I think I would have to disagree with you for various reasons. Well, first to begin with, this has this is an electrical vehicle which offers four by four functionality. So you can use this for various different applications. For example, if there's a fire and also you can control this vehicle autonomously. So for example, let's imagine a scenario where there's a fire and not no persons can go inside, but you have some important documents or for example, a pet stuck in the, fire inside your room. So you can drive this autonomous vehicle and go inside and get rescue the pet, for example. And you can also use it for different applications. For example, military applications, you can embed a camera on top of this uh, autonomous vehicle, and then you can drive it into the region which you need the surveillance, uh, which you need the surveillance of. And then you can use this again. So this application has various, uh, this project has various applications. You can also implement this product on a whole uh, larger scale as Tesla has done. Tesla has a different, Tesla has a Model X, which is four by four, which has four by four functionalities also. But the difference there is that they have a shop connecting to front wheels. In our project, we don't have the shop. So this reduces the mechanical wear and tear. So you have better functioning and better maintenance of the car. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Dr. Omar, thank you. Dr. Omar. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nihaja. Nihaja, look, um, um, electrical vehicle is a hot topic, as we know. It's uh, 
So many teams worldwide are working on that and, uh, and samples are already available in the market. So uh, at conceptual level, have you done any comparative study uh, in a manner that what makes, what makes me, for example, motivated to go to your model conceptually rather than the other available models? What's, what's the benefits here? Yes, as I explained <coughs> by a shaft. So in other models, uh, other, other electrical models, are the, the wheels are connected with the shaft. Here, we don't have the wheels connected via a shaft, and hence we have less mechanical wear and tear. So you don't need to do maintenance for the shaft, for example. Does that answer your question? Yeah, partially, yes. Thank you. Uh, the last question is a factor draw. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Neja, and um, uh, rightly so. Very timely um, um, research topic to to do. Uh, my question is is a lot more general on uh, on the benefits as a, as an undergraduate. What benefits did you get, and are you continuing, or or the teammates are continuing in the same field? Well, as as the project, the project was really interesting because electrical vehicle electrical vehicles is a really hot topic, as mentioned by Dr. Armour. And as of now, I'm working with Infineon and I'm working on an automotive chip. So it is somewhat in the same factor, same area. My teammates are also uh, one of them because they have different goals and different ambitions. So as of now, some of them are working and some of them are doing their masters and they are also pursuing something in electrical, in automotive industry. Also okay. focusing Thank towards electrical much. vehicles. Thank you. May I raise my question uh, as, as a last question to you? Yeah, sure. Um, it's just for cur curiosity. Uh, um, is this um, very helpful or helpful for the handicap drivers? Oh yeah, yes. Because it has the autonomous functionality, you can also, you don't necessarily have to press the pedal to accelerate the, <clears throat> excuse me, to accelerate the car. You can just uh, maybe have a touch screen where you can press, okay, accelerate, and you can set the speed, accelerate to the speed, for example. Thank you. Thanks. You're welcome. Uh, thank you, Nahja. And uh, now I'm um, moving for the last project for today. And I would like to invite Mohammed Shamlouh from Qatar University to present his re research and investigation into boil off gas recycling into LNG plant stability. Today I'm going to present our Europe project, uh, which is an investigation into boil off gas recycling into LNG plant stability that uh, was with my colleagues Khalid Naimi and Abdullah Al Mulla under the supervision of uh, our uh, doctor, Dr. Saad Al Subhi. So uh, my outline for today is I'm going to give you a, a brief background about the, the topic, our research objectives and the methodology we, ha we have followed. Our results that we obtained from this project, uh, the discussion about these results, and finally, conclusions and uh, some future perspectives for this work. Now, just to give you a brief, uh, I'm sure that most of you know about this uh, liquefied natural gas, uh, since Qatar is mainly depending on natural gas, and it's one of the main contributors to this industry globally. Uh, usually, uh, an LNG plant is, you can imagine it like a big refrigerator. The main uh, aim is to cool down the natural gas to bring the temperature to minus 165 approximately to uh, be able to ship it. Because by that way, we are reducing the volume of the natural gas by around 600 tons, and then we can ship it all around the world. Now, the main problem about that is that the temperature outside is more than 30 in Qatar, uh, in Qatar we, we reach around 50 degrees Celsius. Now this temperature difference from 50 to minus 165 will create some uh, temperature gradient that will enhance some of the liquefied natural gas to evaporate again, which will create a problem that is called boil of gas. And that is considered as a loss. The main problem are the, about the boil of gas is that it contains a high quantity of nitrogen. It, con it contains around 7% uh, weight, 7 of nitrogen, and the global standards are around 1%. So we cannot sell it as it is. 
Now, the current practice is that they just flare it to the air. And uh, our aim is to take and capture the ball of gas to recycle it within the main plant. And as we can see that uh, the ball of gas can source from two main sources, which is the storage tanks directly after we produce the LNG and during the shipping, uh, which is called the jet ball of gas. So our aim is instead of flaring it is to recycle it. Uh, so the main research objectives is to present a systematic way on how to deal with this boil of gas and instead of flaring it, which will save us a lot of money and then uh, we'll save the environment as well because it's, uh, we are burning hydrocarbons and sending it to the air. Um, to simulate rigorously uh, using uh, Aspen Heises different uh, scenarios on how to recycle and then evaluate each of these scenarios economically and environmentally and finally choose the best option among these uh, scenarios to be applied here uh, in Qatar. So this is our overall methodology. Uh, at the beginning, we have estimated the overall uh, uh, flow rate uh, based on the production capacity in, in Qatar, which is currently uh, 77 million ton per annum. And it is supposedly to increase to 110 in the next five years. And then we have run a full LNG process simulation, which is the which was our baseline. This is the baseline simulation for uh, the ABX technology that is currently followed by uh, Qatar Gaz. Uh, it's called the Mega Train. And then we have estimated the potential savings from recovering the BOG. Uh, we have then implemented the recycling strategies that we have uh, suggested. And then finally, we have evaluated each one of these scenarios economically and environmentally. So uh, all of the work has been done uh, uh, in Aspen Heises as a simulation. So uh, to start with, we have based our simulation uh, or our, our calculations uh, based on five different uh, tanks of BOG and we have assumed a vaporization rate of 0.5% uh, by volume and we have uh, taken that data from, uh, from uh, Qatar Gaz directly and they have confirmed this uh, percentage. So to start with, we, we simulated the LNG plant which con contains from uh, four main uh, sections. The, main, uh, the, the first section is the conditioning in which we strip out all the impurities uh, from the natural gas uh, that is extracted from the well. And then the NGL section in which we extract the heavy hydrocarbons because mainly in the LNG we want methane, some of the ethane, but not higher than that. And then the main or the core part of the, the plant, which is the liquefaction plant. And finally, the nitrogen rejection unit, which we uh, take out the, the nitrogen. And this where lies the problem, because since I told you that the ball of gas contains 7% of, uh, of nitrogen, now recycling it will cause uh, nitrogen buildup inside the plant. So we have considered uh, different scenarios. Now a preliminary estimation of the savings of, or the potential savings, that amount of ball of gas can save around $3 million per year but it can also save uh, 3,600 tons of CO2 from being emitted to the air. So uh, these are the three main scenarios we have uh, considered. The, the first scenario is that we want to take the ball of gas and then directly recycle it within the main plant, just before the liquefaction plant. And then we have considered uh, for that scenario, three different cases. Uh, for the nitrogen rejection unit. A flash drum, which is the simplest way, and this, this is the way that is uh, used in, in Qatar gas, but this may not handle the extra nitrogen load. So we have simulated a single distillation column nitrogen rejection unit and a double distillation column NRU. And then the second scenario was a separate uh, ball of gas liquefaction unit. So we, we will create a mini refrigeration cycle just to liquefy that extra ball of gas. And finally, uh, to implement heat integration within the main plant, 
in which we will use the cold streams of uh, the plant to liquefy and bring down the temperature of the bowl of gas uh, to use it again and then uh, recycle it back to the uh, main uh, plant to strip out the nitrogen. So uh, after analyzing uh, uh, all the scenarios, we have uh, considered a lifetime of 20, uh, 20 years for each scenario. And we have calculated the uh, total annualized cost for each of the scenarios. So uh, we have come that the separate BOG uh, cooling cycle option is uh, the best, although it has uh, a total- uh, Excuse me, Mohammed. Excuse me, Mohammed. you have two minutes left. Okay, sure. So comparing all, all the scenarios, we can see that uh, the, the, separate cool, the separate BOG cooling cycle is not the cheapest, but it will have the highest environmental impact. And we gave a 70% to, to the environment because uh, it's of most important because we know that 1.2 million for, for an industry is not that much. So, uh, uh, considering all the scenarios, we have uh, concluded that having a separate uh, BOG cycle is the best uh, scenario. Uh, finally, in conclusion, we have produced a systematic procedure for uh, using this uh, boil of gas. And then uh, we have concluded that implementation of heat integration technique is the best option uh, among uh, the studied one. Uh, the economic benefit can reach up to 3 million uh, annually. And we, we said that uh, it will cost, the total annualized cost is around one. So we will have around uh, 2 million of uh, extra benefit. And we will be able to save around 3,500 uh, 3, tons of uh, CO2 from uh, being emitted. Now, finally, uh, for future perspective, what we did not consider in our study is the flocculation of the natural gas and carbon prices. So we can consider that uh, in other scenarios. And also we can consider the implementation of uh, a cooling cycle within the ships that ship the LNG. Uh, and uh, finally, I would like to acknowledge QNRF for uh, supporting this uh, project. and. Uh, I would like to acknowledge Prof. Farid bin Yahya, who submitted the initial proposal idea. He was a former member of uh, Qatar University, but he left. So we took it over. So, and thank you all for listening, and uh, I'm open to any question. Uh, thank, thank you, Mohammed. Uh, I think I will give the floor now to raise the questions from uh, the panelists. I'll start with uh, Dr. Drew. Thank you, Mohammed. Uh, uh, very good uh, presentation and also very good analysis. Uh, uh, my, my question is regarding the carbon pricing. Um, so I, I know fluctuations is part of your future plan, but have you done any sensitivities and at what pricing does the BOG actually become break even? Okay, uh, actually when we did the analysis, we took the LNG price for the last two years and we took the average of that and consider it as a fixed uh, price. This is uh, why I said that we have to consider the flocculation of uh, the LNG price into uh, consideration. So for now, we did not consider the flocculation. We just took an average value for the uh, last two years. Uh, so maybe I was not clear. I'm talking about the carbon pricing. So you used dollar forty per ton. At what price of carbon does this technology break even? Okay, uh, so for the uh, for the separate uh, cooling cycle, it will break even after uh, seven years. For, this is for the optimum. Uh, this is for the best option, the best studied scenario. Um, the next is uh, Dr. Hisham. Uh, hi, Mohammed, and thanks for the presentation. Uh, I have a, uh, a question regarding the um, distribution of the BOG. You, you, you have two components, the T BOG and the J BOG. Yes. Um, but I haven't heard um, analysis as to the contribution of each component to the overall problem and 
um, uh, presumably there'll be different approaches for different components. What you can do on land is different from what you can, can do uh, in transit uh, in, in the sea. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if you could talk to uh, these issues. Okay, uh, good question. Now, usually it is estimated that around 4% uh, of the produced BOG produced on land and 7% uh, is produced on, uh, uh, on jet or the GBOG, JBOG. Uh, for the current- no, Mohammed, How can I stop you there? I'm, I'm looking for the contribution of each. So out of 100% loss, how much is lost to the G, JBOG? No, not four percent of the volumetric uh, from uh, the, the the bulk of the liquid. You have a total of one hundred percent lost. Yes. Uh, BOG. How much? How many uh, in, in terms of percentage are lost inland, and how many in uh, sea? Yeah, I get your question. Uh, it is around uh, forty percent that is produced from land, and sixty percent is produced from uh, the jets. This is an estimation. It can go from 30 to 40, and it can go from 60 to 70 for the jet. Uh, currently, uh, all of the BOG that is produced uh, on jet is flared. There is no current practice for using that, for uh, recovering that. Uh, all the available technologies, uh, there are some available, available technologies, and uh, I just heard that uh, recently Qatar Gaz has, uh, has implemented a new project. And all they do is dealing with the uh, with the BOG that is produced on land. Because if you want to capture that uh, BOG that is produced on ships, you need uh, very large tanks to capture it. And this will minimize the, the, the space that you have to, to store the LNG itself. Uh, but uh, some research recently, that they are focusing on implementing some some cycles inside uh, or uh, on the on the ships itself, but there are some concerns about the the safety and the risks that, that are taken because if you have a process that is running uh, on a on a moving ship, this might not be considered safe. So as for our consideration, we we have only considered the BOG that is produced on land. We did not focus on the although it it, it is considered as the uh, as the smaller portion, it's only 40%, but uh, this is uh, where the technology have gotten uh, until now. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hisham. Um, I think uh, now it's uh, Dr. Omar. Uh, thank you, Mohammed, for, for the presentation. I, uh, I understand that um, the BOG uh, separate cycle scenario, you concluded that that's uh, your best scenario, mainly based on the <coughs> environmental impact and yes. not the uh, cost effectiveness. Now, how about the other scenarios in terms of combination of these two factors, environmental plus cost effectiveness? Why, they may, in combination, be better than the BOG separate cycle scenario. So can you please yes. shed some light over that? Yeah, uh, good question. Thank you, doctor. Uh, actually, we have considered both the economical and environmental and all of them, and uh, the assessment is on both. But we have given the most share for the environmental. We have given 70% for the environmental impact and 30% for the economical. Since uh, the amount of uh, the economical uh, is relatively low for our industry, because we're talking about millions of dollars, and I don't think that is a problem for our industry to, to, to spend a few millions. So uh, uh, overall, uh, still after considering these uh, two components, we have concluded that the separate POG cycle is the best among which. And uh, the problem about the, the, uh, the other ones is that they have, that we, we will have to, to spend more energy uh, to, uh, and also we, we will have to do some modifications to the main, main plant because Currently, what they do, what they have for the nitrogen rejection unit, is the simple uh, single flash drum. Now that will not work, so we have to to do some uh, replacements, and that is additional cost, and that is a disruption of the current uh, uh, plants. And there is no way uh, that an industry will stop its operation to save a few millions. So uh, the best option, the best practical option, actually, is to to have something aside just to keep the, the current process running and to, to, to build your uh, 
your solution aside and to, to deal with it without disrupt, disrupting the main plant. So this is why uh, this is the best option. Thank you. The last but not the least is uh, a question from Dr. Munir. Uh, I can't hear, Doctor. I guess you're. Uh, the, yeah, the, the last is uh, uh, Dr. Munir's question. Yes. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, yeah. As I understand, this is a simulation work. And uh, this, uh, a question which empirical model you use for the simulation, you know, to, uh, to reach your uh, results? Is it the Leakester Flocker or the Benedict Web Rubin uh, model? Which model you used for your simulation? Uh, for the fluid models, we have used uh, Bing Robinson, and this is the suggested way from nature for from Qatar Gas to to because this is the model they use for uh, their uh, simulations uh, using. And, uh, yeah, and uh, then what, what's the what's next? What 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 you're planning to do next with the outcome of your project? Uh, we have uh, currently prepared uh, a manuscript uh, and uh, we have submitted it to the Journal of Energy and Conversion. It is not currently under review. Uh, so we hope that uh, it's accepted. Uh, now, next, we want to consider uh, the, uh, as I told you, the flocculation of the prices because this will have a huge impact and this might not be a, a valuable option to. To implement, if, if we consider the flocculation and uh, the other with, with the other scenarios. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mohammed. Um, I think uh, that's it for today, and I hope that you all had something to new to learn today. And I promise there is lots more to come tomorrow for our biomedical health and social sciences, arts and humanities presentations. See you tomorrow at the same time and stay safe. Stay home, by the way. Thank, Thank you all. Thank you. Yeah.